the traveller. He was rolling in the first early dark down a snowy road, his headlights pinched between dark walls of trees, when the engine coughed, recovered, coughed again, and died. Down a slight hill he coasted in compression, working the choke, but at the bottom he had to pull over against the three-foot wall of ploughed snow. Snow creaked under the tyres as the car eased to a stop. The heater fan unwound with a final tinny sigh. Here, in its middle age, this hitherto dependable mechanism had betrayed him, but he refused to admit immediately that he was betrayed. Some speck of dirt or bubble of water in the gas line, some momentary short circuit, some splash of snow on distributor points or plug connections, something that would cure itself before long. But turning off the lights and pressing on the starter brought no result. He held the choke out for several seconds and got only the hopeful stink of gasoline. He waited and let the flooded carburetor rest and tried again. And nothing. Eventually he opened the door and stepped out onto the packed snow of the road. It was so cold that his first breath turned to iron in his throat. The hairs in his nostrils webbed into instant ice. His eyes stung and watered. In the faint starlight and the bluish luminescence of the snow, everything beyond a few yards away swam deceptive and without depth, glimmering with things half seen or imagined. Beside the dead car he stood with his head bent, listening, and there was not a sound. Everything on the planet might have died in the cold. Indecisively seeking help, he walked to the top of the next rise, but the faintly darker furrow of the road blurred and disappeared in the murk. The shadows pressed inward. There was no sign of a light. Back at the car, he made the efforts that the morality of self-reliance demanded. Trying to see, by the backward diffusion of the headlamps, he groped over the motor, feeling for broken wires or loose connections, until he had satisfied himself that he was helpless. He had known all along that he was. His hands were already stung with cold, and around his ankles, between low shoes and trouser cuffs, he felt the chill like leg irons. When he had last stopped, twenty miles back, it had been below zero. It could be ten or fifteen below now. So what did he do, stranded in mid-journey, fifty miles or more from his destination? He could hardly go in for help, leaving the sample cases, because the right rear door didn't lock properly. A little jiggling swung it open. And all those drugs, some of them designed to cure anything. Wonder drugs, sulfurs, streptomycin, oreomycin, penicillin, pills and antitoxins and unguents, represented not only a value but a danger. They should not be left around loose. Someone might think they really would cure anything. Not quite everything he told the blue darkness. Not a fouled-up distributor or a cranky coil box. Absurdly, there came into his mind a fragment of an ancient hymn to mechanical transport. If she runs out of dope, just fill her up with soap, and the little Ford will ramble right along. He saw himself pouring a bottle of penicillin into the gas tank and driving off with the exhaust blowing happy smoke rings, a mock heroic montage of scientific discovery unreeled itself, white-coated scientists peering into microscopes, adjusting gauges, pipetting precious liquids, weighing grains of powder on minuscule scales. Messenger boys sped with telegrams to the desks of busy executives. A group of observers stood beside an assembly line while the first tests were made. They broke a car's axles with sledges, gave it a drink of the wonder compound, and drove it off. They demolished the carburetor and cured it with one application. They yanked loose all the wires and watched the same magic set the motor purring. Batiri stood in light overcoat and thin leather gloves without overshoes, and his car all but blocked the road, and the door could not be locked, and there was not a possibility that he could carry the heavy cases with him to the next farm or village. He switched on the headlights again and studied the roadside they revealed and saw a rail fence with cedars and spruces behind it. 
when more complex gadgets and more complex cures failed, there was always the Lucifer match. Ten minutes later, he was sitting with the auto robe over his head and shoulders and his back against the ploughed snowbank, digging the half-melted snow from inside his shoes and gloating over the growing light and warmth of the fire. He had a supply of fence rails good for an hour. In that time, someone would come along and he could get a push or two. In this country, in winter, no one ever passed up a stranded motorist. In the stillness, the flames went straight upward. The heat was wonderfully pleasant on icy hands and numb ankles and stiffened face. He looked across the road, stained by horses, broken by wheel and runner tracks, and saw how the roadside acquired definition and sharp angles and shadows in the firelight. He saw, too, how he would look to anyone coming along, like a calendar picture. But no one came along. Fifty minutes stretched into a half hour. He had only two broken pieces of rail left. The fire sizzled, half floating in the puddle of its melting. Restlessly, he rose with the blanket around him and walked back up the road a hundred steps. Eastward, above jagged trees, he saw the sky where it lightened to moonrise, but here there was only the blue glimmer of starlight on the snow. Something long and buried and forgotten tugs in him, and a shiver not entirely from cold prickled his whole body with goose flesh. There had been times in his childhood when he had walked home alone and been temporarily lost in nights like this. In many years, he could not remember being out alone under such a sky. He felt spooked. His feet were chilled lumps. His nose leaked. Down the hill, car and snow swam deceptively together. The red wink of the fire seemed inexpressibly far off. Abruptly, he did not want to wait in that lonely snowbank ditch any longer. The sample cases could look after themselves. Any motorist who passed could take his own chances. He would walk ahead to the nearest help, and if he found himself getting too cold on the way, he could always build another fire. The thought of action cheered him. He admitted to himself that he was all but terrified at the silence and the iron cold. Closing the car doors, he dropped his key case, and panic stopped his pulse as he bent, and frantically, with bare hand, brushed away the snow until he found it. The powdery snow ached and burned at his fingertips. He held them a last moment to the fire, and then, bundled like a squaw, with the blanket held across nose and mouth to ease the harshness of the cold in his lungs, he started up the road that looked as smooth as a tablecloth, but was deceptively rough and broken. He thought of what he had had every right to expect for this evening. By now, eight o'clock or so, he should have had a smoking supper, the luxury of a hot bath, the pleasure of a brandy in a comradely bar. By now he should be in pyjamas making out sales reports by the bedlight, in a room where steam knocked comfortingly in the radiators and the help of a hundred hands was available to him at a word into the telephone. For all of this to be torn away suddenly, for him to be stumbling up a deserted road in danger of freezing to death, just because some simple mechanical part that had functioned for 30,000 miles refused to function any longer, this was outrage, and he hated it. He thought of garage men and service station attendants he could blame. Ignoring the evidence of the flooded carburetor, he brooded about watered gas that could make ice in the gas line. A man was dependent on too many people. He was at everybody's mercy. And then, on top of the second long rise, he met the moon. Instantly, the character of the night changed. The uncertain starlight was replaced, at a step, by an even flood of blue-white radiance. He looked across a snow meadow and saw how a rail fence had every stake and rider doubled in solid shadow and how the edge of woods beyond was blackest India ink. The road ahead was drawn with a ruler, one bank smoothed by the flood of light, the other deeply shadowed. As he looked into the eye of the moon, he saw the air shiver and glint with falling particles of frost. In this white Christmas night, the good King Wenceslas night, he went warily, not to be caught in sentimentality. 
and to an invisible audience he deprecated it profanely as a night in which no one would believe. Yet here it was, and he in it. With the coming of the moon the night even seemed to warm. He found that he could drop the blanket from across his face and drink the still air. Along the roadside, as he passed the meadow and entered woods, again the moon showed him things. In moonlit openings he saw the snow stitched with tiny perfect tracks, mouse or weasel or the three-toed crowding tracks of partridge. These two, an indigenous part of the night, came back to him as things once known and long forgotten. In his boyhood he had trapped and hunted the animals that made such tracks as these, it was as if his mind were a snowfield where the marks of their secret little feet had been printed long ago. With a queer tightening of the throat, with an odd pride, he read the trail of a fox that had wallowed through the soft snow from the woods, angling into the packed road and along it for a little way, and out again, still angling, across the ploughed bank, and then left a purposeful trail of cleanly punched tracks, the hind feet in line with the front, across the clean snow and into the opposite woods, from shadow across moonlight and into shadow again. Turning with the road, he passed through the stretch of woods and came into the open to see the moon-white, shadow-black buildings of a farm and the weak bloom of light in a window. His feet whined on the snow, dry as metal powder, as he turned in the loop of drive the county plough had cleared, but as he approached the house, doubt touched him. In spite of the light, the place looked unused somehow. No dog welcomed him. The sound of his feet in the snow was alien, the hammer of his knuckles on the door an intrusion. Looking upward for some trace of telephone wires, he saw none, and he could not tell whether the quivering of the air that he thought he saw above the chimney was heat or smoke, or the phantasmal falling frost. Hello? he said, and knocked again. Anybody home? No sound answered him. He saw the moon glint on the great icicles along the eaves. His numb hand ached with the pain of knocking. He pounded with the soft edge of his fist. Answer finally came, not from the door before which he stood, but from the barn down at the end of a staggered string of attached sheds. A door creaked open against a snowbank, and a figure with a lantern appeared, stood for a moment, and came running. The traveller wondered at the way it came, lurching and stumbling in the uneven snow, until it arrived at the porch, and he saw that it was a boy of eleven or twelve. The boy set his lantern on the porch. Between the upturned collar of his mackinaw and the down-pulled stocking cap, his face was a pinched whiteness, his eyes enormous. He stared at the traveller until the traveller became aware of the blanket he still held over head and shoulders and began to laugh. My car stopped on me a mile or so up the road, he said. I was just hunting a telephone or some place where I could get help. The boy swallowed, wiped the back of his mitt across his nose. Grandpa's sick, he blurted and opened the door. Warmth rushed in their faces. Cold rushed in at their backs. Warm and cold mingled in an eddy of air as the door closed. The traveller saw a cot bed pulled close to the kitchen range, and on the cot an old man covered with a quilt, who breathed heavily and whose closed eyes did not open when the two came near. The grey whiskered cheeks were sunken, the mouth opened to expose toothless gums in a parody look of ancient mischief. He must have had a shock, the boy said. I came in from chores and he was on the floor. He stared at the mummy under the quilt, and he swallowed. Has he come to at all? No. Only the two of you live here? Yes. No telephone? No. How long ago did you find him? Chore time. About six. Why didn't you go for help? The boy looked down, ashamed. It's near two miles. I was afraid he'd... But you left him. You were out in the barn. I was hitching up to go, the boy said. I'd made up my mind. The traveller backed away from the stove, 
his face smarting with the heat, his fingers and feet beginning to ache. He looked at the old man and knew that here, as at the car, he was helpless. The boy's thin, anxious face told him how thoroughly his own emergency had been swallowed up in this other one. He had been altered from a man in need of help to one who must give it. Salesman of wonder cures, he must now produce something to calm this over-worried boy, restore a dying man. Rebelliously, victimized by circumstances, he said, Where were you going for help? The hill place. They've got a phone. How far are they from a town? About five miles. Doctor there? Yes. If I took your horse and, what is it, sleigh, could someone at the hills bring them back, do you think? Cutter. One of the hills boys could, I should say. Or would you rather go, while I look after your grandpa? He don't know you, the boy said directly. If he should wake up, he might wonder. It might. The traveller grudgingly gave up the prospect of staying in the warm kitchen while the boy did the work, and he granted that it was extraordinarily sensitive of the boy to know how it might disturb a man to wake from sickness in his own house and stare into the face of an utter stranger. Yes, he said. Well, I could call the doctor from the hills. Two miles, did you say? About. The boy had pulled the stocking cap off so that his hair stood on end above his white forehead. He had odd eyes, very large and dark and intelligent, with an expectancy in them. The traveller, watching him with interest, said, How long have you lived with your grandfather? Two years. Parents living? No, sir. That's why. Go to school? He got a queer, sidling look. Have to till you're sixteen. Is that the only reason you go? What he was trying to force out of the boy came out indirectly, with a shrugging of the shoulders. Grandpa would take me out if he could. Would you be glad? No, sir, the boy said, but would not look at him. I like school. The traveller consciously corked his flow of questions. Once he himself had been an orphan living with his grandparents on a back farm, he wondered if this boy went as he had gone, knocking in imagination at all of life's closed doors. The old man's harsh breathing filled the overwarm room. Well, the traveller said, maybe you'd better go finish hitching up. It's been thirty years since I harnessed a horse. I'll keep an eye on your grandpa. Pulling the stocking cap over his dishevelled hair, the boy slid out of the door. The traveller unbuttoned his overcoat and sat down beside the old man, felt the spurting weak pulse, raised one eyelid with his thumb, and looked without comprehension at the uprolled eye. He knew it was like feeling over a chilling motor for loose wires, and after two or three abortive motions he gave it up and sat contemplating the grey, sunken face, the unfamiliar face of an old man who would die, and thinking that the face was the only unfamiliar thing about the whole night. The kitchen smells, coffee and peanut butter, and the mouldy, barky smell of wood from the wood box, and the smell of the hot range and of paint baking in the heat, those were as familiar as light or dark. The spectacular night outside, the snowfields and the moon and the mysterious woods, the tracks venturing out across the snow from the protective eaves of firs and skunk spruce, the speculative, imagining expression of the boy's eyes were just as familiar. He sat bemused, touching some brink as a man will walk along a cut bank trying to knock loose the crumbling overhang with an outstretched foot. The ways a man fitted in with himself and with other human beings were curious and complex. And when he heard the jingle and creak outside and buttoned himself into the overcoat again and wrapped his shoulders in the blanket and stepped out into the yard, there was a moment when the boy passed him the lines and they stood facing each other in the broken snow. It was a moment like farewell, like a poignant parting. Touched by his pressing sense of familiarity and by a sort of compassion, 
the traveller reached out and laid his hand on the boy's shoulder. Don't worry, he said. I'll have someone back here right away. Your grandfather will be all right. Just keep him warm and don't worry. He climbed into the cutter and pulled over his lap the balding buffalo robe he found there. The scallop of its felt edges was like a key that fitted a door. The horses breathed jets of steam in the moonlight, restlessly moving, jingling their harness bells as the movement lengthened itself. The traveller saw how the boy, now that his anxiety was somewhat quieted, now that he had been able to unload part of his burden, watched him with a thousand questions in his face. And he remembered how he himself, thirty years ago, had searched the faces of passing strangers for something he could not name, how he had listened to their steps and seen their shadows lengthen ahead of them down roads that led to unimaginable places, and how he had ached with the desire to know them, who they were. But none of them had looked back at him as he tried now to look at this boy. He was glad that no names had been spoken and no personal histories exchanged to obscure this meeting, for sitting in the sleigh above the boy's white, upturned, serious face, he felt that some profound contact had unintentionally, almost casually, been made. For half a breath he was utterly bewitched, frozen at the heart of some icy dream. Abruptly he slapped the reins across the backs of the horses. The cutter jerked and then slid smoothly out towards the road. The traveller looked back once to fix forever the picture of himself, standing silently, watching himself go. As he slid into the road, the horses broke into a trot. The icy flow of air locked his throat and made him let go the reins with one hand to pull the hairy, wool-smelling edge of the blanket all but shut across his face. Along a road he had never driven, he went swiftly towards an unknown farm and an unknown town to distribute, according to some wise law, part of the burden of the boy's emergency and his own. But he bore in his mind, bright as moonlight over snow, a vivid wonder, almost an awe. For from the most chronic and incurable of ills, identity, he had looked outward, and for one unmistakable instant, recognized himself.